breathe out. So now that you're in this mellow place, let me start you back up again. <laughs> so welcome to Unity of Palm Harbor. If you're new here, come and play with us today. We have a book outside that you can sign up to receive our email. And today is going to be an extra special day because we're going to do something really different when it comes to the offertory. And if you're watching When Pigs Fly, there's just a special little announcement. you got to wait until then. Meanwhile, Reverend Bob, who was here for 25 years, came to visit me a couple weeks ago. And he said, you know, our anniversary for purchasing the property is coming up in July. And I know you like a party. I said, well, this is just kind of that group. So on the first Sunday in July, Johnny Bossy's family is going to do our Italian feast. Yes, yes. We've had fun with the barbecue, and we also know it is hot, Florida. So we're going to do that inside, and I wish I had like a drum roll. Do you have a drum roll? <laughs> It could have been the theme to Jaws. I don't know. We're in Florida. These magic little orange tickets. Your board member has 10 of them. Each one of the board members has a goal to sell to you a ticket, $25, to win a $500 gift card on Southwest Airlines. You can go anywhere that Southwest Airlines goes. So each one of your board members, raise your hands high. We have our tickets. <laughs> And you can buy them in the bookstore. And you can buy them in the bookstore. This is a fundraiser for Unity of Palm Harbor. And we're going to actually call the winner on July 7th at the Italian Feast. And I understand we're going to have some goodies for the children. So bring your family, bring your friends, come enjoy this. Know that we are celebrating, celebrating 25 years on this property. And I will share something that Reverend Randy shared with me, our very first minister. Years before we purchased the property, he and someone had already found it. But it was tied up in litigation. So I understand he may have walked to the back of the property, found a special tree, set a blessing, and planted some coins. Within about 10 years, that property became Unity of Palm Harbor. Set your intention. You never know how it's going to show up. And it may not be anything like you think. So with those incredible thoughts in mind, I invite you to close those outer eyes. Take a nice breath in and release. You are in the right place at the right time, right here, right now in what I will declare this to be a holy sanctuary, a place where we are already whole and complete to ourselves, a place where we know and fill ourselves with that God energy, that we feed and nourish each other with that spirit and the divine, knowing that there are no mistakes, no mistakes. We are already in and of the image and likeness of God. We declare that to be our truth today as we play, as we enjoy music, as we learn about Amen. And what does that mean as unity teaches? We bless each and every person here and each and every person whose lives you touch. For we know where two or more are gathered is the Christ. We declare that to be so. In gratitude we say thank you and amen. amen. So I was asked, or I was thinking, that we're a unity church. So let's talk about some unity ideas. Why are we different maybe from some other churches. And so, you know, when I get up here, I don't usually tell a joke because I don't carry them off very well. So I'm totally going to blame my father for this one. You ready? So he said this to me over the Internet. The pastor's wife was expecting a baby, so he stood before the congregation and asked for a raise. After much discussion, they passed a rule that whenever the pastor's family increased, so would his income. After six children, it started getting expensive. And the congregation decided to hold another meeting and to discuss this pastor's expanding salary. A great deal of yelling 
an inner bickering ensued as to how much this pastor's children was costing the church. The pastor listened carefully for about an hour. And then he said, children are a gift from God and we will take as many gifts as God gives us. And one little lady in the back of the room raised her hand. Rain is also a gift from God, she said. But when we get too much of it, we wear rubber boots. <laughs> and the congregation said, Amen! <laughs> so that begins our story on Amen. I have to tell my dad he did a good job. <laughs> so... What is more unified than a field of amen? I wanted to know, how does unity look at amen? And I found it as one of the most powerful words in Scripture. We often forget its original meaning. In the Hebrew context and the Greek translations, amen was not so much about it will be done in the future, but it was a declaration like affirmative prayer, it is done now. It is complete now. Eric Butterworth, and I'm using his book, The Universe is Calling, says in the ancient Hebrew and Greek in which the early Bible was written, the amen is normally given to mean, verily it is established. It is true. This is the truth. If you'll think back to the Genesis story, we actually have two creation stories in Genesis, but there's a time when God is talking about creating the day and the night and the firmament. And at the end of each one, he says, and this is true. This is good. This is very, very good. And I looked back at that and I looked at the historical perspective and the creation story, as many of us are beginning to study the metaphysical meaning behind the stories, it's not the literal meaning of creation, but rather it's our opportunity as we are creating our ideas to declare them to be true. Amen? Amen. Amen. During that time period, the Jews were wandering and they were captive by the Babylonians. And what does this mean to a group that follows one God? Well, now all of a sudden they're in captivity of a group that has multiple deities. So to firm up the Jewish faith and to keep them centered, they created these stories about creation. After each day was created and God said, let there be light, and there was light. God said, let there be a firmament, and it was so. In the original Hebrew, after each statement, it said, Amen. Amen. As it's already done, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish and the sea and the birds of the air. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created male and female. He created them both. Behold, I have given you every plant, every tree, every beast of the earth, every bird of the air, and everything that has breath, and so it was. Y'all are getting the hang of this. So again, the idea, when we look at things in a metaphysical sense, each one of these creatures is an idea. Each one of these times you go into that God mind, your divine mind, and you have a magical idea and you play with it and you dance with it and you firm it up. And at the end of it, you might say, this is my truth. This is what it makes sense for me. This is what I'm creating. This is what I'm birthing, my new experience. And then you declare, verily, this is my truth. And you say, amen. you guys are so good. So let's look at amen as a law of consciousness. How do we apply allegories to our lives today when we look at metaphysical translations? In chapter 2 of Genesis, we're talking about consciousness. 
Now, y'all didn't know all these things were in there, did you? Unless you've been studying for a while. So then the Lord God said, It is not good that man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air and brought them to man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature was its name. Now Butterworth clarifies that for us. The creation story is an allegory dealing with a divine creative process, both universally and personally. Lord God means divine law. God wasn't looking for names of the creatures he created. The creatures represent our ideas. So here's the key. You ready? It had everything to do with what it became as Adam called it. Our ideas are everything we claim them to be, how they influence us and our perspective. So when you give voice to your dreams, when you set your intention, be careful what you're manifesting. Things always become to us what we see them as being, which is why when we have an idea, and we all might have a similar idea, or we've heard an idea, we may interpret it differently because we all come from the different backgrounds, our teachings, our cultures, our experiences. So what we believe about a thing is what it becomes to us. The key here is knowing what we say and what we think is our truth. Because Eric Butterworth says... Whatever we are thinking about as our truth becomes our amen. We're doing amen today. <laughs> so we're saying this is the truth of something that comes into our awareness, something that comes into our consciousness. The Egyptians even recognize the power of amen. I know we have a few people who have traveled here to Egypt and probably know this. The Pharaoh Amen, Hotop. Amen, Hotop. Tutankhamen, Tutankhamen, y'all know him as King Tut, has Amen in there. There was Amen Ra, the sun god. Amen. So to the Egyptians, Amen meant the ruler or master. So Butterworth challenges us to the things that we hold in our consciousness that we declare to be a truth for us, that becomes our ruler in our consciousness. He says, whatever you unite your amen to becomes your master and rules you. I had to think about that. What we focus on, what we give power to, what we believe in, becomes true for us, amen. amen, as if it is already done. That's the power behind amen. It's not something that's going to happen down the road. It's something in your consciousness, like affirmative prayer, we declare to be true right now, in the present moment. So speaking of prayer, how do you pray? Think about it. When you come and meet with our prayer chaplains, when you're in quiet time, you walk a meditation path, you're beneath the trees, you're listening to the birds, and you enter that God stillness time, your time with God. What do your prayers sound like? Are you begging? Are you beseeching? One example was, oh God, I am sick and tired of this. What did you just focus on? Sick and tired. Sick and tired. So the universe says, okay, I got you. We're going to give you more sick and tired. You are saying amen to limitation. Change that perspective. I would suggest be gentle. Be gentle with yourselves. 
as you're learning this process, as you're learning the power of affirmative prayer as if it is already done, you want that to be what you want it to be, not sick and tired. So remember your words, remember your thoughts, shift them. And there are times when you don't want to be puppy dogs and rainbow tails. There are times when you are thinking, I don't want to smile for everyone today. I have some very strong women in my family. Do not tell me to smile. Be authentic. Be true to you. And don't camp out in those negative nillies. You are saying amen to limitation. Let us open our minds and be curious. Butterworth said, God cannot have mercy on you, for there is no unmercy in God. Listen to that. God cannot have mercy on you because in the mind and consciousness of God, there is, no, there is no unmercy. And so I interpret that to mean you are loved unconditionally. There is no place in God's mind, in this beautiful loving spirit that we actually call love, we call life, we call substance, we call power. It's all loving towards you, unconditionally, unconditionally. Then comes forgiveness. Butterworth says, God does not forgive you, for there is no unforgiveness in God. So when we're working with forgiveness, who's it about? Ourselves. Somebody was going to say amen. <laughs> so who is that about when we are looking at forgiveness, when we feel like someone has done something to us, and then Butterworth challenges us once again. He says that the only way we can take something in that we may believe to be against us as if we've already had some experience of that. And I thought, wow, that's pretty rough. The things that I need to forgive myself for, not even people outside of me, means that some experience that I've had that didn't feel rich and rewarding and loving and giving. And who is our worst critic? Sometimes it's ourselves. So it would be my suggestion, like the oxygen mask in the airplane, Forgive yourself first because God's already done it. There's no forgiveness element that God has to say, you know, you, you got it wrong, but I'm on your side this time. And you, no way, no way, not happening. It's all unconditional love when it comes to God. So we look at amen as a form of consciousness. When you accept something as true, you are saying amen. Butterworth, this is what I just said. Butterworth said, you will never experience anything in the world of your body and affairs that you have not previously accepted in one form or another in your heart. Your reaction to a person depends completely on what you are identifying with, which also says much about you. I shared with a few people. In ministerial school, I had this one instructor, minister, long term, and he and I didn't see eye and eye from day one. Nothing. And I felt he was picking on me. I thought, you just can't handle a strong female. I don't know what the truth of that was, but I believe that to be true because somewhere in my life, I had experienced that. And this little molehill turned into a mountain that I wrote the dean about. I wanted it to go to the board. And the dean somewhat savvily came back and said, so where is this in your consciousness? I'm not saying amen to that. And I thought, wow. And you know what? It took me about two years to get that. Because I know he did me wrong. But it's something I believed about myself that he as a teacher, instructor, gift of God brought forward. And sometimes that's not comfortable. Sometimes that's not comfortable. So we change our perception. You've heard it said, pray for thy enemy. Have you heard it said, pray for thy enemy? For when you do pray for someone outside of your inner circle, 
that you feel is not acting in your best interest, what do you do? You shift that energy. That prayer, yes, you're praying for them, but where does it ricochet back to? You become calm. You become quiet. You become steadfast. And all of a sudden, that energy is going to shift. Either they will leave your circle and you can say thank you, or you're going to shift in your attitude towards them. This is how we create a more harmonious, balanced relationship. It's always about us. So I would suggest, are we like Adam in the garden? Are we naming all those little creatures, all those ideas, all those experiences? How are we looking at that garden? We had our new member class yesterday. And one of the little excerpts in it is talking about how does unity look at the Bible? And I said this was one of those beautiful ministerial questions with a checkboard. You got to get it right or you don't get to go forward. Don't pass go. Don't collect 200. So I looked at them and I said, so here's the deal. Think about it. In the origin of time, we are told the Garden of Eden was perfect. They had everything they wanted. And they were curious because God said, here is the tree of knowledge. And if you take or partake of this tree, you will become like me. So, of course, what do they do? They partake of the tree, that curious nature. And that opens their eyes to knowledge and wisdom. And they get booted out of the garden. And we take the entire Bible to get back in the garden. We started out pure and perfect. You ever seen a brand new baby come into the world? We believe in the original blessing. There is no original sin. That itty bitty soul is as close to God as we're ever going to be until the day we say goodbye to this earth. It is pure and perfect, just like you. And then we have these earthly experiences that we clear out. We clear out. And the ones that we want to bring in to our consciousness and hold on to, to those we would say, verily true, amen. amen. Verily true, amen. there you go. So it gives us an idea how to look at the strength and the power of the word, amen. I like to say, so it is, still claiming it to be true. However, biblically, that amen has its own rhythm, its own strength. So I invite you, as it feels right for you, to put your amen stamp on what you do want to create in life. Mark eleven twenty three 23 says, Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, be taken up and thrown into the sea and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Amen. Amen. So what is a mountain? We're not talking about a real mountain. We're talking about an obstacle. When we believe in ourselves, when we believe in the truth for ourselves, those mountains will move. Those mountains will move. I want to share with you some parting words of Butterworth in this beautiful book, The Universe is Calling. The universe is calling, singing its song of life and love into your whole being. You are one with the divine flow. You are in tune with health and substance and love and peace. You already have everything you need. You walk and work in tune with the infinite process that turns all things of your life to good. And to this we say, Amen. 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 So that includes the message for today. However, I'm not leaving the platform. <laughs> Amen. <laughs>